degree in pharmacology and did his thesis on inhalation toxicology. Uh, he received his Ph.D. in pharmacology and uh, did his postdoctorate research in teratology and also attended the University of Iowa Medical School. He developed and presented data on methylmercury that were first uh, demonstrated that the best cells of the brain were specifically responsible for the observed toxic effects. He's developed and published a method used today to predict to lead, arsenic, styrene, lithium, on and on and on. Uh, his topic today is on a mutual uh, interest topic uh, on the toxicology of chloride. And as you, many of you know, this has been a, an acute uh, area of interest of mine for a number of years. And I have to say that Bill is one of the real world-class experts in this area as well. So it's my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Marcus. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Okay. I want to say a little bit about um, fluoride. I was in the office of uh, Bridgewater, the branch chief, when they promulgated the original fluoride regulation at uh, four parts per million. And I remember at the time the politics that went into that. And I told my supervisor, uh, Dr. Catruvo, that if asked, I would have to tell him that this was not a scientific decision, that it was a political decision based on the fact that uh, Jack Ravan who was beholden for his position to Strom Thurmond, insisted that the level be set high enough so that his uh, constituency wouldn't have to spend any money cleaning up the water supply. At that time, there were lots of things that happened we didn't know about. One of my friends, Paul Drake, was responsible for writing the background document for Flora. And Paul Drake said, Bill, you know, I'm lying. I said, you're not supposed to lie, Paul. You took an oath. I know, but I'm resigning right after this project. <laughs> but Bobby Carton, an old pal of mine, we started together in the office of toxic substances, moved his home from here in Alexandria out to some place called uh, uh, Point of Rocks, Maryland. And little to his, little did it was known to him that not very far away was a neighbor that makes aluminum. And these people um, produce tremendous amounts of fluoride in the aluminum bauxite reducing process. And we're dumping it into the groundwater. Bobby Carton got really upset about the idea that there was lots of fluoride around his farm. And he got all the Paul Holden was a friend of both of ours, started a simple campaign saying we want to do things based on the science, not on politics. And I told him that it was a little late. And not to bother me about this, that I said my piece and it was in the record, and that's the last I was going to say anything about fluoride. In um, 1990, it became there was a there is a publication, and I'm going to hold this up just so you can see what I'm talking about. About the study done at the National uh, Toxicology Program, and this is what the study looks like. It's about three times as thick as any one I've ever seen. Out. Very interested in the study because I had had studies done for the Office of Drinking Water by the National Toxicology Program. And it takes about four years once you request a study for the study to be um, actually performed. And just about that time, a very interesting gentleman that's known to you, Rich Fisher, named um, John Yamiana, started yakking at me. He said, oh, no, no, the story about fluoride is long, long story. And I, I got for him a four, four pages of the chronology of fluoride up until March 7th, 1990. And he's been fighting fluoride from another point of view, which was that he did a study when he was working at the National Institutes of Health that showed that fluoride, based on the epidemiology studies, was a carcinogen in humans. He caused an incredible amount of trouble for the NIH, which resulted in a hearing. 
um, which, of the committee, which is now uh, chaired by uh, Mr. Weiss of New York. And they said, you guys are going to have to do a study on fluoride. By that he meant, at that time, the National Cancer Institute. And the uh, Congress appropriated money and gave direction. Fluoride shall be done. Thirteen years later, this report comes out. So that's at least three times longer than normal. The head of the National Cancer, the head, well, the head of, of the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, who was in charge of making sure the study got performed because the National Toxicology Program came under his direct supervision, is a gentleman by the name of Dr. David Rawl, whom I know very well. A very, very great man. He managed to get underneath his wing almost all the toxicology programs done by the federal government, with the exception of two. Um, the FDA programs, which are independent, and the Environmental Protection Agency programs, of which I was a part. And he fought mightily to get those, but the Congress wouldn't give it to him. He, at the time, and was until the time of his resignation, the highest ranking non-political, and I put that in big quotes, officer of the Public Health Service. He was like a three or four star admin. Uh, he had been in the public health service for many, many years and had risen to the top-ranking top person by virtue of position and years of service. And what I want to say is the public health service is the early, well, let's see, 1946, 45, 47, has been touting the use of fluoride for the purposes of preventing dental caries very, very strongly, as you all know. So it was not in Dr. Rawls' interest to get the study done with alacrity or to to tell the truth about the studies if they didn't already support the preconceived ideas of the public health service. The same thing is happening right now. Two things are going on in the federal government. One is that the Office of Drinking Water has stated, back in 1990, that they are going to revise the fluoride uh, standard and that they were going to get they were going to use what they call the Frank Young study. I'll get into that in a little, long, a little greater detail as the basis of it. There was a hue and cry from the internal scientists, including myself, and outside scientists saying that the Frank Young report was tainted. So the Office of Drinking Water, instead of giving it to the resident scientists, who certainly have a lot of expertise in the area, decided to exercise their, um, their uh, uh, discretion and give the problem to the National Academy of Sciences. I want you to know that that's a private institution. It has nothing to do with the government. Now, I've run many studies with the National Academy of Sciences, so I knew right then and there that the fix was in. Because the National Academy of Sciences uh, was told to choose a chairman who was pro-fluoridation. And the members of his team are all pro-fluoridation. So you're not going to see any report that's different or in any way substantially different from what's come out from the Frank Young report, which is also stacked. As I recall, it took a freedom of information request and some threatening for them to even release the members of the panels of the Frank Young report. What I'm trying to say is that fluoride turned out to be an extremely controversial subject. I approached it strictly as a scientist because I was interested in the new data that had come forward and I was aware of the Yummy Honest and Burke report, and I thought that they had gotten a kind of a raw deal. I want to say something in defense of um, arsenic. It's not very toxic. I mean, you guys talk about arsenic as being a bad chemical. Arsenic is, by definition, required for good health. If we were to eat a diet devoid of arsenic, reproduction efficiency would drop almost to zero, and those that were successful would, have, would die in about four months. This was studies done here in the United States and in Eastern Europe. You need about 40 micrograms a day for good health, and you can, you can ingest up to about 250 uh, micrograms on a daily basis without any adverse effect. And arsenic, uh, I'm not gonna give a big lecture on arsenic, but basically you have to have arsenic on a daily basis, high levels, something you see 250 micrograms a day before you'll see any of the adverse effects on a chronic basis. And as arsenic becomes methylated, arsenic 1, 2, or 3, it becomes successively less, successively less toxic by a factor of 10. 
And what we get in seafood is the trimethyl arsenic, and that's almost non-toxic. And arsenic is used in huge quantities on rice and chicken. But they're both methylated, substan methylated substituents, and people don't get sick from them. So arsenic's getting a bad deal here. And I, I, I have a chart put together by Bob Carton in which he was trying to show um, how toxic fluoride is compared to other chemicals we all know about, and arsenic's not on this list. The daily dose of uh, fluoride is 7.9 milligrams per kg per day. That's if you allow for the 4 ppm um, standard, okay? Vinyl chloride, which we all know is a human carcinogen, the level is set as 1.7 milligrams per day. The carbon tetrachloride, which will give you cancer, and central lobular necrosis called uh, yellow atrophy is 47 milligrams per kg per day. Benzene, which in using the allowable level, is 50 milligrams per kg per day. And that's six times fluoride, and so is carbon tetrachloride. And I will tell you for a fact that benzene, if you're exposed on a daily basis to almost any level that exceeds 10 or so parts per billion, you will get a problem in the blood. I don't know what that's going to be. It depends on the individual, but a problem will occur. Chloroform, 160 milligrams per kg per day, and that's 20 times the fluoride dose. And tetrachloroethylene, which is a carcinogen, is 386 milligrams per kg per day. That's 46 times the dose. And red dye number three, which is sort of a joke, <clears throat> never really was a carcinogen. Miss <laughs> um, Robbins would love to hear me say that. Uh, you have to get about 4,000 milligrams per kg per day for 500 times the fluoride dose. So we're talking about an extremely toxic compound based on the levels one can get that EPA has set. Okay, this report came out and I got a hold of it and I read it. And what bothered me was the argument in the report was that you saw the same sorts of effects in the control, historical control groups, but not in the dose control groups. So I sat down with Bobby Carton and, and the John Yomianis, and on page like a hundred and something in this book, it talks about the control groups. Um, and it says that the level, the historical instance of control male rats was such and such, okay, and was such and such and it describes the level of fluoride in the con historical control animals. And since the historical control feed was derived in a great, from a great part from um, fish, concentrated fish meal, there are high levels of fluoride in it, relatively high levels. And those levels, and you'll see in the, some of the slides, I've put in sort of a ghost area. That's the level that the historical controls are dosed at, and there are about 6,000 animals that we have data for that one level. So you can see that's a very important level. Let's see what the first slide looks like. All right. Um, the incidence of osteosarcoma in male rats consuming various levels of fluorine in the drinking water. I want to say something about osteosarcoma. This is the, the 11 ppm is the historical control level. Osteosarcoma. I try to produce this in animals at various times for the purposes of developing an experimental model. I was unable to do so. And what happened was, I just found, I found out just by accident that there were several studies that were producing osteosarcoma. They were in the beagle dog, they were a result of plutonium or radium exposure, and they were being, and they were lifetime studies. That these dogs took 15 or 18 years to develop the material. The problem. And here, these animals are getting it in their lifetime, which is two years. So osteosarcoma is a very, very interesting, interesting problem. Uh, at the time this was done, they claimed that osteosarcoma only occurred in rats and was that applicable to humans. And I'm going to talk about studies that have occurred since then. Talk a little bit about toxicology. We have a great toxicology with it. Toxicology for this type is Zeratsia. So I'm going to do a little teaching, something you don't often get the chance to do. You want to see three things in a, in a study that does carcinogenicity. The first thing is a dose-response curve. If you can show a dose-response curve, you really have 
suggestive evidence, much more than just just some level, some animals getting some some cancers. And two, you'd like to see something that's rather unique, like a mesothelioma or um, angio uh, cholangiocarcinoma that you got with vinyl chloride. Okay, and here we have osteosarcoma, extremely rare, occurring in rats. And it's better, it gets better, better. And you'd also like to see a time to tumor response, and I'll show that to you later. So here we have a dose response curve that has a straight line if you assume that the um, animals are exposed to a, a, lo a low dose. Next one. You can't go much higher, by the way, because the animals become toxic. Okay, that's, remember, you count, that's one kind of cancer. Here we have incidence of squamous cell metaplasia in the oral cavity of the rats. These are the diagnoses given by the people who did the actual study. And that's the Patel Columbus people. That's, that's just the contractor. And they had on staff board certified animal pathologists. And as you see, we get another straight line relationship. A different cancer, a different straight line relationship. One of the other things you look for in a carcinogenicity study is multiple sites of cancer. Number two. It's very interesting to note. Very powerful kinds of stuff. Next one. These are um, the combination of uh, what I call lumps and bumps. Some cancers, some precancers. And as you see, this is something that occurs, uh, the lumps and bumps and the cancers occur, occur at, a, at a low rate. <coughs> Six tenths percent in these animals. When you give them up to the high dose, the 79 parts per million, and the 45 and the 11, you get a you get an internal and an external straight line relationship. And this is different than the osteosarcoma and the, and the first one. This is the second one. It's in the next, next slide. Instance of thyroid follicular cell tumors in rats. Now, this does not occur in normal studies. Follicular cell of uh, uh, thyroid follicular cell tumors I've seen before as a result of things like PCBs and synthetic um, uh, steroids. All right, they're new. They're not unusual, and they do occur but it's another kind of cancer you're starting to see, the fluoride. And even though the levels of occurrence are low, they're dose responsive. And the reason you can't go above 79 or 80 is once you, once you start getting a little higher, the animals start dying, getting very sick. The next one. Okay. I haven't got, the, I haven't got these all in order, but liver hepatocholangiocarcinoma. I want to say something about that. That's an extremely rare tumor. That was reported by Dr. Melvin Ruber in the literature in the 60s. And it, it, it simply doesn't occur except in the face of a chemical exposure. As you notice, when we added up all the cancers, it's a straight line too. Next. One of the criteria that they like to apply, and it's in the cancer guidelines, it's promulgated by EPA, is they like to get it in both sexes. If you can get the cancer in both sexes, it's what they call an increase in weight of evidence. And while you see the, the female rats uh, don't respond as, as well as the male rats, they get cancer as well, but they also got hepatocholangiocarcinoma, very rare disease, and osteosarcoma also rare bone disease. The next. This is mice, second species. This, another major criteria for calling a chemical a carcinogen as a result of animal testing is multiple species, and they consider rats and mice different species. This hasn't got as nice a 
dose response as the others, but there is a definite occurrence of hepatophalangeal carcinoma. Very, very rare, uh, almost never seen in mice. Not as dose responsive as the other, but also, you, you, if it works for the fact that overwhelming evidence of other cancers, they dwell on this and say, well, that's probably dose responsive. Next slide. This is a combination of male and female. I think it's the same as the one we just had before. I got, I got a letter from Bob Carton. This is Rudolf Ziegelbecker, and the stuff I'm going to discuss is Dr. Ziegelbecker's uh, papers. And uh, we're going to come up with the... Uh, I just want to let you know, he, this is his analysis, slides, and figures. Okay. What we're talking about is a timed tumor response. David Gaylor, who was the chief biostatistician for the... NCTR, which is in Arkansas, not Alabama, uh, uh, said that one of his criteria for really believing a chemical is a potent carcinogen is if you can, dis if you, if you can show that there is a true time to tumor effect. Okay. Becker did here. Now let me explain this. On the on, to the right of the graph is the actual incidences that he has put down. The X and the being the level of sodium fluoride and the incidence in time and days on the y-axis. And then the third one is where the um, y sub x axis, where it's actually crossed. And then he developed this guy's a physicist. And then he developed the um, straight line equation. And that's where you get the y equals b sub zero, b sub one x plus e g. That's this. That's the regression lines equation. These numbers correspond to where these crosses. I mean, he's actually crossed the days. And if you look at this, all organs malign malignant lymphoma and histiocytic sarcoma. Um, and I think this one is in uh, male, uh, female mice. And what you see is the dose response curve for that endpoint. And then in the female mice, all organs um, see number two, I have to look at that. Figure four. Chart. Yeah, that's this one. Paper. Yeah. shows there's an inverse incidence between um, uh, the first incidence in days and the abnormalities in female mice with respect to sodium fluoride and dose, which, which is basically saying the higher the dose, the fewer days you need to, the, the less material you need to cause a response. Okay, the next one. Dose response curve. Done here is he took all the malignant lymphoma and histiocytic sarcoma and all the malignant tumors respectively. It shows there's a dose related incidence of the abnormalities. So, what you've got here sodium fluoride incidence. And this is his way of showing those bar graphs. As the incidence uh, increases, so does the dose. And number four is the same thing. The first, day, the first day of the incidence 
chose to be related to the dose. So it's a, it's a time related curve. These are the days. At 175, you get uh, the first response at 250 days. And at the high, at, at uh, 20, you start getting incidences at 300 days. So it's, what's important about these curves is it shows that the time related to the next one. You rarely, you rarely see this in studies. Same thing. Overall response, incidence in days. And these are in um, all malignant tumors. And uh, uh, the female mice and then the inverse relationship. Okay, the next one. Now I, I took this data and manipulated it. Same story. All organs, benign tumors. It shows that there is a, a dose response to the benign tumors, but it's at a very short rate. The next one. Now I took his data and I transformed it. I have the sodium fluoride in, um, in dosages and the uh, uh, incidences of the days. And I made this a little, little clearer, so that it is in fact a dose response curve, even when you connect the actual doses. Okay, the question then becomes, <clears throat> how relevant is this to humans? You know, everybody knows about sodium uh, cyclamate. Right? You took four boxcars. It's not really a carcinogen. Or um, any one of the carcinogens we normally talk about, we're talking about levels of exposure many, many times to thousands of times of what you see in humans. Well, the way I wanted to look at this is, since this causes the most problem in the bone, what's the level of the animal's experience in their bones compared to the level of human bones? So how do we do that? What's the story there? Human bone levels the same as, equal to, or greater than the levels you see in the animals. The next slide is when I prepared to answer that question. As you can see, the bone ash is directly related to the exposure level in fish or rats. Okay, and you get up to about 6,500, 6,000 ppm in male, adult, white, humans who are exposed to permissible levels in drinking water, their levels run about 8,000 ppm. So what we've got here is this one of the really rare instances in which the dose that people get is higher than the carcinogenic dose the animals get when you look at the place it's caused and the material it's causing. All right, now to get a little, have a little fun with the dentist. Why do we put this stuff in drinking water? Don't put it up. What, what is fluoride supposed to do? Fluoride is, I've been told, by every local dentist I've ever gone to, prevents tooth decay. I want to know the, the data for that. And when I was at EPA, they produced this. I can't remember the guy's name. They had this stuff that was done, hmm? no, it was done in Texas. Anyway, I looked at the data and I got Burke to look at the data. He said, oh, I've got that study. But you see, he didn't include this point and that point and this point. He didn't like that. He selectively chose that data. So I, I put together a bunch of data that, of four, I'm going to call them modern studies, 87, 86, 89, looking at the tooth decay in fluoridated, partially fluoridated, and non-fluoridated permanent teeth. And these are decayed, missing, and filled permanent teeth per child. I couldn't tell any difference. So what does that mean for the regulator? I mean, why the hell put this stuff in water? We know it's a hell of a It's terrible stuff. If you have enough, if you give a child who's three or less a tube of toothpaste that has fluoride in it that the parents are using, it will kill them. So it's a poison. And when I when I asked Carton and Burke. Carton and Yummy honest about this. They said, oh yeah, that's well known. These are just some of them. Dozens of studies that show the same thing. So I couldn't understand why you even put it in the water if it doesn't work. All right? 
So I asked the question, why do you put it in the water if it doesn't work? The response was, well, Bill, you put it in the water because if you're going to pay for a water system to be built, you have to include in the plans and build the fluoridation room where the government won't help. And that's a fact. Next. What was all the stuff that Burke was talking about, that Burke and Yomiyana talked about? Increased human cancers, right? This is the Yomiyana and Burke studies, which just showed over the period of time, they compared the levels of cancer in fluoridated versus non in areas that were once non-fluoridated and after they became fluoridated, the rate of death. And as you can see, there's an increase in cancer deaths. Now this was, there's a long story behind this. Uh, when this was first submitted, there was a, and I, had, I, I could go into excruciating detail, there was questions about the techniques used by Yomi and Burke. Claiming they didn't age adjust, they didn't sex adjust, they didn't do this, they didn't do that, they used the wrong statistics. So they went back and they, did, they corrected for every single complaint that was made by the CDC. And you know, the curve didn't change. There was no substantial change in the curve. Look at the next one. Okay, these are, these are um, authors that have looked at the increase in cancer rates in their various countries, not just what John Yomianis did, and he's really much more effective at this than I am, because this, I'm detecting me out of my area, I'm just doing this, Bob Carton only does this. If you look at these guys, you can see the increase in cancer rates range anywhere from four, five, six percent to 40 percent increase. The increase in cancer instances goes up also. So this is real. I asked Dr. Ziegelbecker, who did the, who did the uh, time for tumor stuff, what he had seen. And we got some correspondence back, and he measured the increase of cancer rates in, in places like Basel, in which there was a long history of cancer incidents going into the 50s, and then they started in Florida. And it's no different than the results here. So it's been confirmed all over the world. Okay, if that's, such, if, if, if that's so great, why are we still doing it? Just look at the countries in the world that have decided to not fluoridate, either by law or by policy. As you can see here, these are not off-the-wall countries. Austria, France, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. These are very sophisticated Western countries. And as I understand it, more are doing this every, every year. that originally approved the use of fluoride, fluoride for fluoridation. And the levels, they, the levels they approved were based on two, it was one part per million. And I'm, I'm going to say some, some things about that. It was based on an idea that um, the temperature had something to do with the in, intake of people, uh, uh, people's amount of water. The flaw in EPA's current thinking, and they, and they acknowledge this, is that they're assuming that people drink two liters a day. I'm drinking a glass of water, maybe they only drink two liters a day. But anytime I cook some vegetables, it plates out on the, the green vegetables. Anytime you have Coke uh, that's made at your local, uh, local uh, bottler, anytime you have a soft drink made at your local bottler, anytime you have a beer, anytime you make um, tea, which has very has high levels of fluoride anyway from the leaves, your, your intake goes up. So the actual exposure to fluoride is much, much higher than just the two liters a day you would get from drinking water. 
Yes, sir. My first ex exposure to this whole fluoride issue was before I was even in dental school. And I remember uh, that there was a study done in New York State between two cities. One was Kingston, the other was a city across the river, in which one city supposedly fluoridated the water, the other didn't, and then they compared the, the results of decay missing and filled teeth after a number of a period of time. Supposedly, the city with fluoride had a significantly reduced amount. I don't know if that's true or not, but can you comment on that? Yes, well, the original studies were flawed in the sense that the only material I was able to determine that had an effect wasn't fluoride. It was natural stuff in the old days. We this were in Texas. Is, this was, I understand, not naturally fluoridated. They actually artificially fluoridated. If, if, if John Yomias was here, he'd probably know how the statistics were fiddled with. But I want to say about the natural stuff, because I looked into that. That they couldn't fiddle with. It turned out that the, that the highest correlation was not with fluoride, but the highest, the highest correlation was with another element, uh, strontium. Strontium really seems to have an effect on tooth decay. Let me comment on that. On the, on the study. That was not a blinded study. They, they investigated some of the exam, exams in one city were done by hygienists, but they knew what they were supposed to discover. Mm -hmm. And the, what John pointed out in uh, a similar thing in, in, in Rio just recently, he said, when you have one and one, he said, what you're comparing is A against B. That's not a valid study. He says, like if you have two rats and you give one rat cattle ration dog food and the other rat uh, rat chow and the one with rat chow died, you wouldn't say that rat chow kills rats. You'd have to get 100 rats and give them rat chow and 100 rats and give them cattle ration. Kingston versus city A versus city B is one against one. And that's what's wrong with those studies. Because like Ottawa, Kansas, when they fluoridated, tooth decay went up, but they withdrew the funding, so that study never published. So one against one, as long as you can manipulate which studies are published and which studies are not, makes your data come out nice. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what's wrong with that study. It, it's actually a terrible study. And I just have one other question related to that. Every dentist knows that over the last six years, the rate of tooth decay has significantly gone down. What, what is attributed to that? Well, there, I've asked that question as well. There are several contributing factors. I don't know the answer. I'm not saying I you know the answer. It turns out that people are far more um, aware of, of dental hygiene than they were in the past. The incidence of, I think, uh, candy and uh, gum and uh, actual sugar gum and stuff has gone down. And, and the kids, I don't, I don't, and they, they, brush, they brush more evidently. And the floor and the floor and the mouth has changed, something like that. Those countries you put up on the on the chart there that don't use fluoride, the incidence of the key has gone down in those countries as well. Parallel okay. to the ones that are fluoride. Yeah, but there's I don't know the real answer, but it it doesn't appear to be fluoride. How are those studies flawed? They systematically eliminated data they didn't like. They didn't fit the preconceived ideas, they actually didn't include them. And when we went back and got the original data, we found that to be the case. Which studies were they? I can't remember the guy's name. Um, those, are the, those are the studies of the... Because I know, as I say, this is, this is not the area you normally talk about. Johnny, I'm going to be honest, if Bob Carpenter would be answering all those questions. Looking from the inside out then, uh, as a citizen, how many studies or how many policies based on studies uh, should I suspect is really being manipulated to meet political needs? No, you can, only, you can that's an easy determination to make. All of them? No, no. Oh. Ones in which there was no money at stake, like ALAR. Okay? ALAR turned out to be a non-problem. They made a big deal out of it. First of all, if it's not a carcinogen, I don't care what those people say. And secondly, the damage it did to the Apple industry in Oregon and Washington State was so minimal that they're making more money than ever. When there is a major amount of money at stake, uh, I'll give you some, for instance, al Alaclor is the largest single pesticide used in the United States. Monsanto makes a quarter billion dollars plus a year profit, okay? It's the, it's the most potent carcinogen I've ever seen. It doesn't even come close. It's better than fluoride. It's at levels in the drinking water supplies in many cities that cause cancer in the animals, okay? EPA made a recommendation it was signed off by everybody except the administrator that this be removed from the market. It's still there today, and we got a response back from the um, Office of uh, Management and Budget saying that it wasn't scientifically correct. They haven't got any scientists in there. 
Okay? So the government's for sale. Alador. Uh, it's true. If there's a lot of money involved, it ain't going to get off. Look at the stuff with the spotted owl, right? The law is clear. They can't cut those forests. So what do you do? You appoint a, a committee that's stacked and it makes the answer, oh yeah, we can do that. That's the way the government operates. You have to understand that J.R. Ewing is sitting in the White House. Okay? If you figure that out, I, mean, I follow his career. As, if there's anything that comes up against business, what would J.R. Ewing do in Dallas? That's what our president does. And so if, if big business is going to get hurt, then they're not going to be regulated. And he's, well, they, we've got 120 day, with, now 210 day moratorium regulations and enforcement at EPA and other agencies is a joke. The only people that will enforce against are private individuals. Explain the moratorium. Oh, well, you know, EPA puts it, usually puts in regulations and publishes them in the Federal Register. The, the president is not allowing any regulations to be published in the Federal Register. No publication. So um, once you put them in the Federal Register, then they can be enforced after the time frame of notice has gone in. So no matter what anybody at EPA does, or the FDA does, or OSHA, or any of these federal agencies, they're not being published in the Federal Register. How would that affect us with OSHA then? It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> suppose you want, I'll talk about benzene, because I know that very well. The current level of benzene is one part per million. It's proposed to be, that's allowable in the workplace in our time weighted average. The proposal is to lower it to a tenth part per, um, per million based on the current um, human epidemiology studies. All right? The, it's still a proposal stage. If they were agreed, and I don't know if they ever will, that that's true, and they would write the regulation, then Mr. Bush has put a moratorium in effect. The regulation cannot be published in the Federal Register until the moratorium is lifted. So even though they've written the regulation and they've got everything set to go and they're ready to publish, it can't be published or it won't become the law of the land. That's how he's doing it. And he just says it. It's not secret. He, he, he announced it. I'm helping the business community by putting a moratorium in regulation for, he said, 90 days. Now it's 120 days. Now I'm sure at the end of 120 days, another 120 days. Well, yes, sir. Um, about a year ago, I think it was, we uh, saw some things in the public media in our federal government about uh, some new studies about fluoride and cancer. You know, CBC. You want me to talk about that? I'd like to talk about that, your perspective on that. What we then heard in the media was more of a preliminary study about the yeah, okay, there's a, there has been a study that's been completed that's under peer review in the state of New Jersey. Um, and it's, a lot, it's very, very ticklish because the state, uh, I won't go, into all, won't go into all the politics. Anyway, we've got an opportunity to look at the study and it turns out that men under the age of 18 have a six-fold increase in osteosarcoma if they live in Florida areas. Okay, the threshold is four. Okay, once you get to six, it's real. <coughs> it's tremendous. And uh, first, the state of New Jersey tried to try to suppress the study. And there's been a lot of stuff going on to make the study pop out. So it's, it's my understanding the study's going to be published in the next several months. What it's actually going to look like when it gets into press after it's been peer reviewed and torn apart is, I don't know. I talked to some of the people that have reviewed it. And they have told me that the study is very solid. It was six times the said? Six times, right. SMR of 600. How many people were in that study? That seems like a, you said that was a very rare type of tumor in prostate cancer. It's the wrong question. The question is how many tumors did they find? I don't know. I haven't seen that. My guess is about eight or ten. Because, uh, but I haven't really seen all the data, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, the benzene regulations were based on no more than seven cancers in the black plants. So that would be done. Hmm? What could be done? I think that we have to, well, there are two things that we can do. We can, we can have an election and see if we can, see if we can choose somebody other than 
the president, the now sitting president, and uh, our choices are very interesting. <coughs> we have Ross Perot, who probably will stop all regulation to kick everybody out until the, until the country recovers. Bill Clinton, who will do the regulations, I would think, or the status quo. Or we can do as Thomas Jefferson has said, the tree of liberty is um, nurtured by the blood of patriots. We've got that in the streets now. I have a question. Uh, when I invited you to uh, come to this meeting some months ago, you were uh, the chief toxicologist at the Office of Drinking Water at the US EPA. What is your status today? I'm not sure. Um, I, have been, I have been informed that I have been terminated, okay? But when I call up the agency and ask them about, I call up the Office of Personnel and call up the Office of General Counsel, they say they know anything about termination. So my guess is I'm supposed to be fired, but they haven't done it right yet. Are they still paying you? Mm, I don't know. I won't know for about another six weeks. Don't you get a check or anything? Well, I get, they're behind. The government doesn't pay on time. Oh. Why didn't they pay me on time? You're always two weeks behind. You have to turn your pay slips. Two weeks, not six. You know, I have at least two pay periods that they owe me. Yeah. <laughs> so at least. Four, I, I won't know. Are they still week. giving you work to do at home? No. Nope. We got to work on that environment too there. Well, well I, I don't think the environment at the EPA, which is kind of poisonous, is going to be changed by the present administration. I think they like people getting sick at the EPA. Any other questions? All right. Does this mean that the new regulations by the FDA, as far as the implementation of the rules about uh, labeling, are not going to go into effect because they haven't published the final rules in which are, I think they're supposed to do in, in November? Can't be published if that moratorium is in effect? That's right. The only thing that's going to be published is letting people get drugs into the system. If you got, you know, if you've Merck or Sandoz or some huge company, and you got something running around, that goes along. That's not a regulation. But if you want to regulate something, it's not going to happen. Stay up here. Bill, thanks. Uh, uh, all the speakers come on up now. Paul, Mike, uh, Megan, Gary. Um, I think that's it. We've got five of us. Five speakers. Uh, no, Certainly. Uh, blindsided on this. I wondered, if, have we done anything? to contact the FDI? We personally haven't done anything to contact the FDI. However, uh, for those who use that's Federation Dentaire International, uh, which is another dental organization of international scope. However, I, I think I can say now with a fair degree of accuracy that our approaches to the ABA have not fallen on deaf ears. Uh, we finally are getting through to them. Uh, we were contacted um, in late February, early March, by a delegate to this year's ADA convention, um, who was quite shocked at the Toxi Society of Toxicology meeting results that he read in the newspaper, and contacted the American Dental Association headquarters, talked personally to Eden Dydal, and said, what the heck is going on? And she said to him, there is no valid scientific documentation anywhere in the world that mercury is even released from dental amalgam, let alone causes any problems. And then he called um, uh, P.L. Fan and asked the same question and got the same answer. So he contacted uh, us and, and said, uh, please, provide me with scientific documentation on the shock, and there's a growing revolt amongst the delegates to this year's uh, ADA convention that could very well destroy the ADA. Well, we're now working in that area, Gary, in that we don't want the ADA destroyed. That's not our intention by any means, so we're working with them now and attempting to help to solve the situation. Uh, that, plus the things that are going on in other areas, uh, and I don't think it's a hopeless situation with the ADA yet. And let me comment on your question, Jerry, on the Federation Dental International. They've just released a 10-point paper on the safety of dental amalgam, and that uh, I called the, uh, right over the day before I left uh, to come here, I called the American Dental Association uh, and their extension for the Federation Dental and ordered a copy of that. Uh, 
um, the, my next project with, with the Academy and the help of uh, uh, some of our uh, members will be to uh, write a scientific rebuttal to their uh, ten-point position. And it is my fervent desire that we can get that published in some kind of uh, uh, journal, if, it, if nothing besides in vivo. Uh, this will be a published uh, scientific paper taking each one of their their points, like uh, where the Enid Nidal says there's no mercury released, and yet uh, even uh, Dr. Talenda admits, well, there are, there's a little mercury paper over them. So um, since it's measurable by every means known to mankind. But, uh, Another question. Uh, what's with Gordon Christensen? You, know, I have... <laughs> you tell me. Well, wait a minute. I, uh, this is a serious question. No, it's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, on almost everything, if I'm going to buy something, I want to know what he said first because right. you can trust his opinion most of the time. <laughs> and, and you can't trust the manufacturer's opinion. Fine. So I, I go with Gordy Christian an awful lot. But when he comes to the mercury, is it because he, he's got, is it part, I mean, is he thinking more again? I hate to say this. All right. but, uh, uh, obviously, you know, it? obviously you as some of us, a lot of others of us, know Gordon personally. Uh, and I think we can safely say that, that Gordon Christensen is probably one of the best known dental lecturers in the world, if not the best. He commands uh, a great deal of not only respect but remuneration for his presentations, which are sponsored indeed by the dental organization, organized dentistry. Excuse me. So consequently, Gordon is in a very difficult position. What Gordon says publicly may not necessarily be what he believes privately. However, I think you and I both can understand why he takes that position. I, uh, I used to subscribe to the uh, Gordon Christensen newsletter until the, uh, the Gordon Christensen took it upon himself to review the uh, National Toxicological Program that uh, Dr. Marcus just reviewed, and that uh, in a totally facetious manner, he claimed that the rats at the higher exposure level were exposed to levels of mercury that would require you to drink a bathtub full of water, and that the monash clearly indicates that it's equivalent to a person living in a fluoridated EPA level for, for uh, 15 years uh, at the top. So so he is uh, part and parcel of the obfuscation of the truth uh, to the dental profession, uh, at least in the subject of mercury and fluoride. Uh, if I may elaborate just a bit more, um, I, I said some of the things that IOMT is doing at the, the, as a preamble to my presentation today. And I, uh, I didn't say what's happened the past two days, for example. Um, uh, about 12 members of the IOMT uh, spent Thursday and Friday visiting members of Congress, uh, their offices, and we, we visited four, about 400 offices of Congress in the past two days. And, and this is only part of what we're doing. We're also sending information with letters of note, uh, scientific notice to all the deans of all the dental schools, all the boards of dentistry, and uh, for, and all the dental manufacturers and alcohol manufacturers that letter out on that letter been sound. And then also we are going to do the same thing with the uh, ADA trustees and officers and the dental insurance companies. We've been busy little viewers and Jerry, it's so nice to see you back. We need your help. <laughs> We've been doing a lot. Uh, Dr. Bless, uh, in the past few years, the American Dental Association has said in defense of uh, the use of amalgam that you really get more mercury from fish than you do from amalgam. In light of the knowledge and information that you have and the limited consumption standards that are in place right now, and the data that you've seen today that the world researchers are, are showing as far as mercury exposure from amalgam fillings, can you give us some kind of an idea of whether or not uh, if, if that's the case, if, if, if there should be warnings out about fish, whether or not, in your opinion, there should be warnings out about the amount of usage? Well, I can give you an opinion. That's what I mean. Uh, I guess my first uh, first thought as a environmental scientist would be that, that I, I would be uncomfortable comparing the, the mercury and amalgams with the methyl mercury and fish in terms of the toxicological properties, and I guess uh, Bill Marcus alluded to methylmercury being much more of a neurotoxin, um, but that consideration aside, I have this personal dilemma as I'm trying to figure out where can I get uh, replacements for my uh, <laughs> amalgam. 
at this at this time. And uh, so I, I guess I would I would tend to feel that uh, that there's a there's a major contribution from mercury amalgams that uh, that clearly would be greater than what you get from fish, particularly if you don't eat fish. I mean, there's, there's no question that it's it's your uh, prerogative as, as to what you eat, and you can limit your intake from that perspective. And just by doing that, you still will end up with a major uh, contribution from the uh, amalgams. May I elaborate a bit on that if I, at this point? I, may I have your permission to do so? There was a, uh, a, a human autopsy study uh, published, and it was published in the Swedish Medical Journal and the Swedish Dental Journal both. It was conducted at Karolinska Institute, uh, and it was the, the, the initial data was published in 1984 and then the final in 1987. It was conducted by uh, Nylander Freiberg et al. at Karolinska Institute, and they used uh, they they he, they measured the amounts of mercury in the brain tissue and compared it to the, to the amounts of amalgam in the, the mouth, and they did another thing, too. They, they compared the amounts of methylmercury with the amounts of inorganic mercury. They found that all of the subjects, whether or not they had amalgams, had low levels of methylmercury in the brain tissue, and that the higher levels of mercury that were found were inorganic mercury and directly correlated to the to the amalgam filling. So I, I think this kind of information is very helpful in trying to uh, elaborate the contribution of mercury of, from dental amalgam versus that from, from fish. They, they concluded it was definitely not from the diet, but from the amalgam fillings in the inorganic form, where they all had a low level of methyl mercury. And my only comment on that would be, I still don't know what the relative impact would be of the inorganic form versus the methyl form. Methyl form is, is a more potent neurotoxin than the organic form, and so uh, even though there would be more inorganic, it may or may not be that much more physiologically uh, active. Uh, all right, let's at, let's at this point, you, you noted that there were three oxidation states uh, for amalgam, and that there were, that, I mean for mercury, and, and, and that it occurred in an elemental form, and in an inorganic form, and in an organic form. And that in the elemental form, we have the metallic mercury, we have the mercury vapor, and, the, and we also have the ionic mercury, which then combines to form either inorganic or organic. Correct? So far? Mostly. Okay, fine. Uh, the, the, uh, in the elemental forms of, of mercury, uh, the mercury vapor form is uh, lipid soluble, does have a, uh, a neutral uh, electricity, and it passes. Uh, cell membranes very readily, including the blood brain and a barrier in the placental membrane. This is, this is well established. So I submit that when we discuss the various forms of mercury, we must include mercury vapor as being very similar to methyl mercury because of these factors for its affinity for neurological tissue as well, whereas inorganic mercury sets in a different uh, status than either mercury vapor or methyl mercury. I haven't seen the data on the, uh, on the HG0 being lipid soluble nor being interacting with the uh, Nielsen Kutz, uh, Berlin, a bunch of research in the 60s. Uh, Berlin, uh, Nielsen Kutz, um, Majos, uh, and then there's uh, Viola and Cassano in the uh, 80s, and then there was the studies done. Uh, 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 Dad, is Dad here? Yeah. What were those studies done uh, on the uh, uh, mercury vapor versus inorganic mercury, uh, where they had the uh, autoradiography. Do you recall the authors of those? There were, there were, no, they were published in the 80s. There were about three or four of them in a row. I was trying to think earlier of the names of the authors. Do you have that in the bibliography? Oh, I have, absolutely. I would love to see we'll that. We'll be most delighted to provide it. Please do. Please do. Okay. Okay. Yes, as much anything as this. What does this organization intend to do to ensure that what is taking place now can't happen again. And the charter, say if whatever becomes, whether the ADA survives or not, if it does survive, I think it needs a significant rechartering in which its ethics... Which organization are you referring to? Okay, um, the International Academy of uh, Oral Toxicology. I O I M O A T Q R Z. <laughs> okay. What I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, do you all have a 
formal strategy with which uh, that can be implemented within a charter, or is it already there, that would prevent what is taking place now from happening again. For example, uh, 50 years from now, 80, 100 years from now, when none of us are here, the, the existing profession, or they could not control Washington the way they do by, uh, I guess, ethics within the charter. Or where, um, I know, for example, I was contacted by a doctor who was wanting to create a database where, where doctors could send in their clinical evidence, I shouldn't say evidence, clinical information. No, no, evidence, evidence is fine. So clinical evidence is valid if it's documented. That's, that's clinical evidence as opposed to anecdotal. That's part of the scientific process. Um, I know, uh, you know, they say that there's no scientific evidence of damage to the human, but at the same time, they're not allowing, I mean, you can't do science with the human, with this. In other words, it seems like they're, there's a weakness in their epistemological framework, their way of what they, they conceive of as being valid knowledge. That it's very limited. And if there's only one valid way of building knowledge that is considered of any significance in this area. And so it seems like there's a very weak epistemology within the profession. Um, that needs to be dealt with. Um, and the whole idea of the ethics of the, of the relationship, not only of the organization and how to deal with I guess reports of problems. When I went to the ADA, they had no avenue for me to file a complaint. There was no form for me to fill out. No way for me to even send them my clinical records. They had no interest. My original contacts with the National Institute of Health, they had no interest either. I could not call Washington and get to someone who could tell me, okay, you have a health problem you think was caused by this product, here, we'll send you form C for complaints or whatever. You fill this out, send it in, follow it up. You have this avenue of which there would be a board or whatever. And in other words, a formal way of filing reports of potential problems or of, of problems that patients believe they have with health products. Where one thing that got me so enraged at the ADA is I get a stone wall and that's people in the dams group there is a tremendous amount of anger um, among the groups even rage among some of the people because constantly running into a wall if the ADA handled it with if they would even accept our clinical records they don't realize how much of a fuse they'd be de defusing uh, instead of the pressure cooker they're building um, so the, the ethics avenue of complaint or avenue of filing a report of problems where patients can always know they're going to have an avenue of, of at least reporting, whether it falls on its face on occasions or not, at least they have a formal way. And then government relationship. What will the, the organization's relationship be with the government? Should the government be stacked by members of the organization or should they be even prohibited from being on it or prohibited from being leadership in it? Be only one member or what of a board? And then, uh, so are, do you all, have you all dealt with those issues for the future? Hey, you're an officer now, if you want to. Sure, executive director. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, should, I, should I tell you about Peter Drucker's book, The Age of Discontinuity, How All Institutions Serve to Protect the Status Quo? Um, or shall we talk about Max Planck, who developed the quantum theory of, uh, uh, and the, he said, the new ideas enter science not by old men considering new data and arriving at new conclusions, new ideas enter science by old men dying, and a new generation growing up familiar with the concepts. So um, I, I hate to be a negative about this, but you know I don't think you're going to convince people who've been sniffing mercury for 30, 40 years of new ideas. They're having trouble finding the car keys. So, um, <laughs> the, in terms of in terms of this academy, is, is what we what we hope to do is base base our decisions and our hopes and our goals for the academy on science. And that and that uh, with people, uh, uh, you know, like Bill and.
and uh, uh, Mike and so forth. The science is pretty clear on a lot of these issues, you know, and it's just a question of stupidity. There is a mechanism for reporting. It's too bad that nobody in our government is familiar with it, but on the back of every FDA form, I received my office a, uh, uh, an adverse reaction report, uh, which they have over 650 at the present time on mercury, and that uh, what they say is, well, we're not really sure that they had adverse reaction reports. We think maybe they just found these forms and filled them out because they were being mean to us. So, you know, uh, when uh, they have no desire to witness the problem, then what you get is more bureaucratic bundling. And since 75 cents out of every dollar you send off in tax dollars pays uh, for government bureaucratic bundling, uh, I don't think you're going to get a lot more uh, responsible behavior out of our government. So I'm kind of with Bill, the government that governs best, governs least. That's Jefferson. That, 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 you know, I'm a Jeffersonian Democrat. And, uh, so I think we can probably do better by the people who are angry to go to the polls. What happens in America when people get mad is they stay home and we get more of the same. So, what about, the good what about your organization? Do you have a, a statement of procedure or ethics? We have, we have, are you, but you know, the ADA has a code of ethics. But they break it. You know, the ADA has a code of ethics. It's against the code of ethics for a, uh, a dentist to uh, uh, withhold from his patients information that's vital that they may have uncovered on their own about health. And yet that's exactly what they're suggesting we do. Is it, you know, the, they, they say, you know, we're supposed to say, well, there's no really mercury and you can get more from fillings. And, you know, they got a whole, a whole pack of lies that you can buy them in a little pamphlet for 25 cents and give it out to your patients. So, you know, so what's ethics? Ethics is something that your parents have to instill in their children. And that uh, regardless of the little paper that you get when you graduate, you know, it's a license to steal or a license to serve, depending on your ethics. And, the, you know, so liars will sign their name on any kind of thing. I guess I can understand that. But we all look back to our Constitution and the articles of it as some way to provide a framework. And we do appeal to it once in a while, and it works on occasions. And I think, you know, any organization uh, that has its charter or Constitution. And uh, it does help shape the character of that institution. We do have a uh, constitution and, and bylaws, and that uh, yeah, there are. Uh, I hope you shake it to its core. Yeah. Well, we're trying to. <laughs> can, can one of you uh, give me a, 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 if you're knowledgeable in the area, uh, give me some kind of idea of what the toxicological signs and symptoms of uh, silver poisoning, copper poisoning, tin, and zinc are. Yeah, all silver. He means he's talking about humans, of course. Uh, uh, briefly, just doing a couple of minutes. <laughs> so, so, silver doesn't have any real toxic effects in humans. It makes the skin turn a little silvery gray color that turns black upon exposure to the sun. It doesn't reverse. Zinc is not particularly toxic. Copper is toxic only to people who have something called Wilson's disease, in which they, are, they have a lack of ceruloplasm in the blood. You know, this is a human. Quite different from aquatic animal. Uh, what was the other one? Zinc. Zinc. Tin. 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 You've got maneuvers and stuff like that. Don't bug me. It's called a national security problem. You're out of water. So they did. So you, the only place to use tribunal tin paints are capital ships. And they, <clears throat> uh, but tin basically is not bad. It's not a particularly toxic substance until you start getting it or in the organic substituent. How about immunologically for any of those? Oh, uh, well, immunologically it has effects. Um, tin, is the, tin and uh, mercury are the most the most potent ones. Um, and nickel, you know, nickel's a big deal too. We use a good bit of that in dentistry as well. So not, not we, but dentistry does. They, they. How about Gordon Christensen? I have a video <laughs> tape at home of him demonstrating the formation of concept inlays. One of the advantages of concept inlays is for those who want metal-free mouths. He's the second one that I heard talk in, uh, in about dentistry who's mentioned that particular frame, metal-free mouse. 
That's what that is a comment. I have another question about the Dental Amalgam Task Force. Who is making up that task force? Uh, and is it the ADA that's uh, working cooperatively with them? Or uh, are they laymen, are professionals, non dental people, anybody? No. Oh, sure. It's not the ADA, it's the FDA. It's making up a task force. Yeah, but are they, are they inquiring or getting the uh, input from dentists? Too? Well, how, how are we supposed to determine that? I mean, I showed you evidence today, documented evidence of the connection between the ADA and the FDA. Uh, and and going, going beyond that to the actual task force, uh, I'm not so certain they put anything in writing anymore about it, although that's possible. But, uh, you know, we can go by the history of the, uh, the organization, the track record, and, and can very, fairly well recognize the influence of the ADA and the Dental Division and the FDA and, and in the NIH and in all these other areas. Uh, but, you know, that's really immaterial. Um, uh, the, the point is the issue itself, regardless of who is directing it. Uh, the FDA has a legal responsibility to its constituents, and as, as Wayne King told you, there is a complaint filed against them in the internal investigative division of the FDA, and that is being investigated. We're doing what we can all the way around on it, and that's what you do. You go after the issue, not the personalities. Uh, and so far as, as far as concept onlays, uh, Dr. David Kennedy uh, has, a, has a superb presentation, and he's got actually in writing um, an IOMT uh, recommendation on the, on the indirect on, uh, uh, composite onlays, whether it's concept or whatever you want to use as a material. But, but I would suggest to you that Dr. Kennedy is, a, is, is a even more informed on that particular issue than Dr. Gordon Christensen is. Oh, well, I but, but I just wanted to mention the concept of the expression Metal free, metal free mouth. mouth. Yeah, well, of course. I've never heard that in dental school. I haven't heard it until the last night. I haven't heard it. You're hearing more of it. Years. You're going to hear more of it. Actually, it's not metal free. No, yeah, it, it isn't. Because kind of, they're putting barium and aluminum in there. So, you know, they, yeah, that's, that's why you use that. That's the obfuscation of the truth. You yeah, can't pronounce that. Because uh, well, I thought it was an interesting comment that I heard, and that's the second person I've heard make that. You're hearing more and more of John Kanka said in Orlando at a meeting there where he doesn't use amalgam. He was questioned about. Uh, a case he was doing, I mean, he was showing about all this beautiful bonding, composite bonding he was using, and one of the audience uh, said, well, you know, why aren't you using amalgam in that case? And he says, well, I don't use amalgam. He said, I don't see how something we can put that, that is so toxic in the dental office can be so safe in my patient's mouth, so I don't use it. He's a, he's a famous uh, lecturer on composite bonding throughout the nation. So things are changing. Who is that? John Kankin. Oh, yeah. Things are changing. <laughs> it's been a struggle, but I... You know, you see a lot of positive signs. Bill, Bill has a little comment to share on barium. Uh, well, in Milwaukee, you know, they, they make this wonderful beer. In about the 19, 19, early 1980s, they were using a compound of barium hydroxide to control foaming of beer. And they found out that in Milwaukee, there was a tremendous number of increases of um, heart attack based on the heart muscle failure. You trace it back to barium. So barium attacks heart muscle directly. Beer. So all you guys be sure to put in those radio opaque substances because they're real nice. Yeah. Yeah. To stop and think about it, a patient had a, a dams person had to point it out to me. I'm so stupid. You know why do you want a, a radio opaque composite? Why do they put these things in it so the dentist sees a radio opaque material on the X-ray? Who cares about the patient? If we're going to be using composites, let's use the radio lucent ones. What makes a material radio opaque, gentlemen? Sam's person had to teach me this. I, I just recently uh, uh, participated in a, uh, uh, a lawsuit case that where uh, a dentist had done non-metallic restorations using radiolucent base material, and that, uh, that she had a, a tooth that wasn't quite comfortable, so she went from that office uh, being treated on a Tuesday to another office on a Thursday, and the dentist took an X-ray and said, ah, He's left decanter, all these teeth. Well, you know, I don't know how bad you got to be to leave decanter one, but to leave decanter ten, one would begin to question whether or not these, maybe there was a question of technique here, and that, you know, an ordinary dentist would have picked up the telephone and called the other dentist and said, did you use a radiolucent base or did you use a cake base? 
But no, instead he said, well, obviously what you need with all this decay is crowns, and so he did, you know, eight or ten crowns instead, but, um, and precipitated a lawsuit, which really should have been malpractice against the dummy that didn't call. But, um, so when you do use a radio lucid restoration, uh, I always make a note of it in the chart, and I tell the patient, you know, if you move or you know, go away or something like that, I want you to know that your records are available for your next dentist so that he'll know the nature of the materials and the, and the stuff that's used in your teeth so you can interpret your extras properly. Or use a glass atom or liner underneath the radio lucid composite but material. There, for Mike's information, there are radio lucid glass atomers also. Are there really? Yeah. Which ones? <laughs> Fuji one. Fuji one is radio lucid? Mike, you can also get a. Radio lucent uh, calcium hydroxide material laid by a uh, uh, there's no barium in it, it's a special order item, but the different kinds of propagation ratio. We don't get it. And it works very well. Hypocalcin. Hypocalcin. Why would I want to radio lucent calcium? Well, so you're in lazy, don't lose. The bench has been made of uh, materials that are used in bonding that are uh, radio uh, without any metal insert. Can you describe some of those that are commercially available? Um, actually, they do have some metals, you know, because like aluminum is a metal and, yeah. you know, silica is a metal. So, I meant without any metals. Without, I, don't, I don't think there is such a thing as a, as a uh, uh, well, you know, you could probably put 100% plastic in there and it disappear in about a minute. Um, I don't, I don't know that there is a uh, completely uh, non-metallic restorative material. Um, I think the... Uh, I think the metal free mouth is is, a, uh, is not possible at the present time. They're looking forward toward uh, using some of the castable glass, you know, like uh, Dicor. Uh, for the people that are really metal sensitive, uh, we put in a castable like a Dicor crown with uh, no uh, with no glaze. The metal in Dicor, uh, the ferric oxalate uh, glaze on the outside is where most of the metal is. Yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, no. Yeah, no stain. Just do you have a yeah. comment back there? I think you asked a question not to be was the material contains ionizable metal. Ah. There's the issue. Go ahead. Right? Yeah. That's just Clifford in the back and, and ionizable metal or one that one that dissolves right. from the material and has access to the body is right. more of a concern to me than, than ones that are just happen to be contained in the material. Precisely. If you have an associable aluminum and have a real nightmare, you can get into an aluminum silicon. That's right, because glass ionomer has an uh, aluminum silicate in it, whereas dental porcelain has aluminum oxide, correct, which is very ionizable. So here again, we're all using uh, uh, porcelain, or most dentistry using porcelain that has aluminum that's, that's coming off it, whereas the glass ionomer has aluminum that isn't. Yeah, so Jess's point is superb. In that respect, what about the, because we were just on that issue about the barium to make materials very opaque, very opaque, is that soluble? In the set materials, particularly when they, let's say, as a base, when they're then covered. When it's uh, when it's used as a uh, in a composite, it's used for basically for one purpose only, and that's to make it radio opaque. Mm -hmm. So so it's a it's an additive. It's not incorporated in the resin mm -hmm. or in the long chain molecule. So therefore, it should be ionizable. Jess, am I fairly accurate on that? Yes, sir. That's the very right. Yes, perculite medium and sizable barium free it's a pyrex glass filler so and so its status is barium free so you guys you guys got brains use them have a little fun take your composites put it on an x-ray film number them and take an x-ray of it and look for yourself it's very simple status is very radiolucent and and as i said use your brains yeah herculite medium size when it's baked in like an indirect composite inlay is one of the hardest uh, inlays that we have But all the other shades, they, it's a little gray. All the other shades uh, uh, have very them. That's why we get the big bucks. Don't smile at us. <laughs> <laughs> Is my check in the mail? Uh, I'm retired. <laughs> no, you don't have to retire. We're heading the right direction. Now, finally, we're heading the right direction. Are there any other questions? Are there any other answers? Are there any other, are there any other questions for the answers? Before we dismiss you all, first of all, for members of the Academy,
Uh, and incidentally, I believe we have at least two new members as of today. Uh, Dr. Mark McClure from Maryland and for taking the day off uh, from whatever you'd rather be doing or you might other be doing to uh, spend the day with us and share uh, information. Uh, that's what this academy is all about and we welcome all of you. And I want to especially thank all of my wonderful speakers for coming long distances uh, in many cases to uh, share and present and uh, I just am very proud to associated with this organization and with the people. Who are you? Bob Reeves? Not another baby. Not another Bob. baby. No, not another baby. <laughs> so, again, I want to applaud all the speakers for Thank you. 